Hello, my name is Dino Hoss, and today I'll be running through Incomplete Records with you. There are a number of parts to this lesson, so you may feel like you want to dip in and out, as the video um, is a fairly long one. So often uh, an accountant is faced with um, a situation where someone who is a non-professional has completed the accounts in an incomplete manner, and as such they have to act as investigator to try and find or piece together the missing information. So based on their uh, knowledge and understanding of accounting, uh, there are a number of different um, strategies that they can use to try and piece together that missing piece of information. The very first one is the um, fact that we know that the equation for uh, the profit is always found out from how much capital the owner began with, opening capital, and how much capital they finished with. This actually is one of the most uh, important parts of um, information because what you could always ask the uh, business owner or owners is how much did you invest and how much did you have at the end of the year and by taking away the opening capital from the closing capital you would assume uh, the difference is either the profit or the loss. So let's say for example um, we started with um, an investment of $10,000 and at the end of the year when you asked the owner or owners how much money they had and they said well at the moment we have $12,000 and that could be in the form of assets and money in the bank of course then when we take away the 12000 from the 10000 you're left with $2,000 which we assume in this case is going to be your profit. Um, the scenario could occur where you may have uh, asked the same question and they say, well, we started with a $10,000 investment, but at the end of the year, when we valued our assets and the money in the bank, we found that actually we've only got $8,000. Well, in this case, clearly they've lost the 10000 which they originally invested. They've lost $2,000 of that, so this would show up as a $2,000 loss. The second part of uh, the incomplete records um, that can be drawn up to try and find missing information is known as a statement of affairs. Now, this often causes students a lot of confusion. Basically, a statement of affairs is an incomplete balance sheet. So what would an incomplete balance sheet look like? Well, as you suspect, it will look like a normal balance sheet. The only difference is that we use it to find the capital at the bottom of the balance sheet or the second part of the balance sheet. So I'm going to draw a very simple one here for you um, with minimal information just to show you what I mean. So the first thing to note is that we would not call it a balance sheet because it's incomplete. We would call it just simply a statement of affairs. And again, that would be as at, it's a moment in time, and then whatever the date might be, okay? Um, and then, again, we would have our non-current assets. And then from that, we would have our current assets, let's say, for example. And we minus from that our current liabilities to give us our working capital. And that would be the top half, essentially, of our balance sheet, as we'd call it, but in this case it's a statement of affairs. So let's just create some numbers here. Let's say that the value of the assets were $100,000 and the value of the current assets were $8,000 and the value of the current liabilities, let's say for argument's sake, were $3,000. See, that would be minus from that figure. And you'd have a total then on the top half of your balance sheet of 100,000 plus the 8 minus the 3, which would give us 105,000. Now, normally what you would do then is you would, if you were operating and calculating as a sole trader, the balance sheet would be financed by, and you would fill in the opening capital here plus any profit minus any drawings, except... Unfortunately, we don't know that information because it's incomplete. So what we do is to work out the new capital, which would be given 
by this calculation here, opening capital plus profit minus drawings, we simply assume that the top half is correct. And we can't check that because normally you'd check this bottom half here using that formula. And if it balances with the top half, you know you've done the balance sheet correct. So because we can't do that, we call it a statement of affairs. And we simply assume that this $105,000 is the correct new capital and we then put that into our accounts for next year. The third method for finding uh, missing or incomplete uh, information is to use the sales ledger control account. Now if you remember from previous lessons the sales ledger is where you keep all your debtors. So another way of describing the sales ledger control account would be a total debtors account. So the easiest thing to remember is to think of this as a giant T account for all our debtors. So if at the beginning of the month we knew that we had $10,000 worth of debts owed to us, that would be shown as an asset, so it's on the debit side. And at the end of the month we knew that we still had $6,000 of those debts outstanding. Then we can fill in all the other pieces of information and mathematically in any equation, if you're only missing one piece of information and you fill in all the others in the equation, you can find out that missing piece of information. So here we're looking for the credit sales. That's our incomplete record. And we would simply uh, post all the other information that we know about. So the returns would have come out of the debtor's account and into returns inwards. In our cash book, when the debtors paid us, it would have gone out of their account and into the debit side of our cash book. Discounts allowed would also be shown on the debit side of our cash book, so it would go out of the debtor account. And those naughty debtors who didn't pay us, again, we would have to write that off, so that would be shown on the credit side um, to cancel out the original debt on the debit side. So add up this side, you've got 62,000, as you can see. We had a balance at the beginning of the month of 10. So the difference between 10 and 62, all right, so you had 62,000 on the credit side and you had 10,000 there. So obviously the missing credit sales would be 52,000. And that's just simple mathematics. And it's where the T account's um, wonderful because it would work it out for you. You'd know, well, mathematically, you can't have 62,000 here showing with only 10,000 at the top, which is your balance brought down. So the missing information is one number is $52,000 for credit sales. Incidentally, you could also, if you knew the credit sales and you were missing, say for example, how much your debtors had paid you and you knew the returns and you knew the discounts, the bad debts and the balance at the end of the month, you could find that 50,000 missing piece of information. Again, as long as it's one part of the equation that's missing, one number in other words, um, then it can be calculated using the sales ledger control account. Similarly, when we are looking for missing pieces of information or incomplete records, we could also use the purchases ledger, which as you know from the previous lesson, is simply the total creditors. So here, instead of thinking of it as a debtor account, we would think of it as a creditor account. So in some ways everything is reversed and we can work out the missing figure for credit purchases providing we have the opening balance of creditors. So again, uh, the purchases ledger which cont contains all the T accounts of the creditors. If it showed that at the beginning of the month we had $14,000 that we owed to um, in terms of our suppliers, we owed them $14,000, that means. Um, we had returned to them $3,000. That would have come out of our returns outwards and into the creditor account. When we'd paid our creditors, that would have come out of our bank account shown in the cash book. So it would be credits and it would be debited and goes into the creditor account. Remember, this is a total creditors. And any discounts they gave us would also be shown on the debit side of the creditor account and the credit side of our cash book. If our ledger control, our purchases ledger control, which contains all our total creditors, also showed at the end of the month we still owed our suppliers $21,000. Well, 
That means on this side of the equation we now have a total of 89,700. But we only have 14,000 here. So if we take the 89,700 and we minus it from the $14,000, then the difference is 75,700, which in this case is the value of all the purchases that we've made from our suppliers on credit and is the missing piece of information. It's worth pointing out here that some tutors and teachers teach this, rather than doing it through the T account, they teach it as a formula. So that, if you like, if you have all of these, you can find the missing red piece of information as um, it's only one piece of information that's missing. Similarly, if you knew the opening creditors balance, you could also find the end creditors balance providing you had all the other pieces of information as well. The fifth and final method for working out incomplete records um, is to use the markup and margin as a way of uh, finding the value of the closing stock. So this is often an area that's uh, quite confusing for many students because it's quite ma mathematical. Um, so I'll draw you a quick um, summary of the difference between a markup and a margin and we'll go through that and then I'll show you how you can apply it to work out the missing closing stock figure. So first of all we should highlight that the markup is the gross profit which is expressed as a percentage of the cost price whereas the margin is the same gross profit but instead of expressing it as a percentage of your cost of sales you express it as a percentage of your sales. So if we look here in the corner, if we knew our cost of sales was $20,000, uh, that's the equivalent um, in terms of a markup of 20%. So 20% of that cost of sales is actually your gross profit. Um, we know that 20 out of 100 is the same as 1 over 5 as a fraction. Um, so to work out our gross profit, all we would do is we'd simply take the cost of sales, which is 20,000, multiply it by 20 over 100 or a fifth, and that tells us that our gross profit is $4,000. Now, if we were expressing that same $4,000, but this time we're not expressing it as a percentage of our cost of sales, we're going to express it as a percentage of our sales. Well, of course, that number is going to be different because the sales figure is larger than the cost of sales. So the first thing to do is to take our original markup, which was 1 over 5, and then convert it into a margin. Now, <laughs> this causes a lot of confusion with students, but basically you take the top number, keeping it simple, put it on the bottom, and add it. So if we know our markup is 1 fifth, we go 1 over 5, we take the top number, put it on the bottom, and add it. So it becomes 1 over 5 plus 1, which is a sixth. So that is now allowed us to convert what the markup percentage is into a margin. The margin is always lower than the markup because uh, you're expressing the profit as a percentage of a larger number. So those mathematicians will get that. Those who are not mathematicians will just try and learn the formula. Um, so now we know that the margin is a sixth. So if we knew the sales was 24,000, margin is the gross profit of 4,000, but it's expressed as a percentage now of the 24,000, the sales, not the cost of sales. Uh, so 24,000 multiplied by 1 over 6, which is the margin, gives us the same gross profit figure of $4,000. So based on our ability to convert a markup to a margin, we can use that information to calculate uh, the missing or incomplete record of closing stock. So often in an exam uh, there'll be a theft or a fire and your job as an accountant is to work out what the value of the closing stock that was lost as a result of that theft or fire. Now contrary to what we've been discussing previously in this video, uh, there are actually two pieces of information missing here, your cost of sales and your gross profits. Um, so we know mathematically in an equation uh, it would be impossible to know the difference or the division between the gross profit and cost of sales, except, of course, we previously learned that we can convert a markup into a margin. 
Now, if you remember, the markup is the percentage of gross profit expressed um, in terms of the cost of sales. And we don't know the cost of sales, so that would pose us a, pro pose us a problem. But we do know how to convert a markup into a margin, and we know the value of the sales. So providing we can convert the markup into a margin, we can work out the value of our gross profits. So just to refresh, um, we would take our markup value, which would be given to us in the question of 20%, expressed as a fraction, that's 1 over 5. We would convert it into the margin to enable us to work out the gross profit in terms or expressed as a percentage of sales. So take that markup of 1 fifth, convert it into a margin, we simply take the 1 over 5, we take the top number and we add it to the bottom, which is going to give us 1 over 6. So now we know the margin. We can work out the gross profit as a percentage of this sales figure, which is 24,000. We simply, to work out our gross profit, we would take the sales now that we are given in the question of $24,000. We would then multiply that by the margin, which is a sixth, and that would therefore give us a gross profit of $4,000. So if you like, we've uh, worked out one of the two pieces of missing information. So we now know that's $4,000. Therefore, we can also deduce that if our sales were 24 and we are left with $4,000 after we take away our cost of sales, then clearly our cost of sales must be, you guessed it, $20,000. Okay, so now we can work out our closing stock because if we started with $5,000, we purchased another 20,000, then in total, during at the beginning of the year and during the year, we must have had a value of $25,000 in stock. And at the end of the year, if we only had 20,000 left, then this closing stock figure, which is a negative because it's minus closing stock, must have been 5,000. 25 minus 5 leaves us with a cost of sales of 20,000. So there we have now worked out the value of the closing stock that's been lost as a result of a theft uh, or even a fire.